Good morning. Man, it's going to be a good day. You want me to tell you why it's going to be a good day? I look back there and I got Keegan and Wyatt on the camera. Those guys, when they're on the cameras, they made me look 25 pounds lighter. And so I'm glad to see those guys on the camera today. Hey, uh, y'all feel okay? Just kind of the drudgery of going to church. Man, we're just going to be here, tough it out. Can't wait to get to lunch. Is that how it's going to roll? I'm so glad that you're here. Hey, Lord's Supper today. You excited about Lord's Supper? I want to ask you this question this morning. What does the Lord's Supper mean to you personally? What does it mean to you personally? In our first service, I asked uh, most of our worshipers, they'll, they'll understand this better. If you had a grandchild next to you and they said, hey, Nana, Meemaw, what does the Lord's Supper mean to you? How would you explain to your granddaughter what the Lord's Supper means to you? Now, I'm not talking about a theological answer. Well, Lord Jesus died for me and it represents his body and his blood. I mean, we, I mean, we, got, I mean, we, we got that. But what I'm asking you is, what does it mean to you? In your own words, heart to heart, what does it mean to Scott? What does it mean to Pastor Kevin? What does it mean to John? What does it mean to David? What does it mean, what does it mean to you? And can you articulate that? I mean, if somebody asks you today, what's this Lord's Supper deal? You know, down through the centuries, some denominations have wandered off into this rote, ritual, liturgic act of the Lord's Supper. Eucharist, they may call it something different, but people know, hey, that's just a part of our routine. Let me tell you, there's nothing about routine about the communion with the Lord. There's nothing routine about that. And so I just wonder today what it means to you. What it means to me has kind of morphed in my life. I mean, at one time, it really meant more of a, a celebration of sacrifice to me. Uh, at another point in my life, it really represented more of a, the self-examination side of things. But man, in recent years, if you're going to ask me today what it means to Michael Cook, to me, man, right now where I am in my walk with the Lord, it's all about grace. I mean, this whole thing, this relationship, I'm just here because of God's grace. I'm so thankful for God's grace. Are you thankful for God's grace? Woo, that's a big deal. Because you and I come today as imperfect beings. Sinners by nature and sinners by choice. We can do some sinning now. And we choose to do that so often. And it's out of that when we bring that expression to our Lord and say, Lord, man, I, I have transgressed. I have sinned. I've, I've gone down some roads, the Lord, that I really didn't intend to go down. But next thing I knew, I was down them. And then I looked back and I saw I really did intend to go down there. I opened the door. I made the choice. And Lord, I'm just bringing all of that baggage today, laying at the foot of the cross and right, right before you and asking you to forgive me. And rather than this judgment, what we see and what we experience is remarkable we feel and sense and know at that moment about God's grace. And so I just wonder for you, after the service today, you and I sit down here on the front row and I say, hey man, hadn't had a chance to talk to you, want to get to know you better, but start off by telling me what the Lord's Supper means to you. Let's drop the churchy words. Let's, let's, let's drop the religious, liturgic facade. I just want to hear an East Texas vernacular, eyeball to eyeball. What does this mean to you? Now, I just wonder today how many of you would be able to articulate that to me. So your homework assignment, spend some time, rehearse, practice, talk to yourself about it, 
come to a place where you have a spiritual foundation that you can come to that you feel certain out of the word of God and what the Holy Spirit is leading you in terms of what the Lord's Supper means to you. I gotta be transparent today, man. I don't like these cups we're using. I don't like this sanitary deal. I don't like the wafers in these cups. They're styrofoam, that's what I think they are. But you know what, that's, that's where we are. I've been trying to imagine the Lord Jesus with a mask on. I mean, seriously, I've been, I've been trying to imagine Peter, what Peter would say about putting this mask on and trying to breathe through it. Can you imagine him, potty mouth Peter? I mean, man, I'm sure he's one of those guys that said, like, I ain't wearing no mask. And it just shows you how weird a time that we live in, man. To think that we're gathering today still under some health protocols and we're fighting some kind of worldwide pandemic and virus. People run around much of our country with masks on. Dude, we live in some bizarre times, amen? I mean, peculiar times. But what I want to invite you to do today is to get past all that. Come with me past all that. It's not about if it's the life way piece of bread or it's the styrofoam. It's really not styrofoam, by the way. It just tastes that way. I mean, it really doesn't matter what brand the juice is. Sorry, we're not serving wine. But the thing about it is, there's a deeper meaning than the elements. Whether we passed around four loaves of bread and everybody grabbed a hunk of it today, or whether we sit around this kind of cup or this kind of juice, that's not why we're here today. We're here today to gather, listen to me, hundreds of people, but we're doing so with one bread and one body. In fact, as we gather together, we gotta to understand something about this Lord's Supper. We gotta understand that it's what I just call memorative. There's something memorial about the Lord's Supper. I mean, think about this, it's as if a dying friend is really leaving something behind for us. As our Lord and Savior went to the cross, just hours before in the upper room, it was as if he called these guys that he loved around and said, guys, I wanna do something kinda in a memorial act here, something I want you to do in remembrance of me after I'm gone. And we're gonna do it just around two ordinary elements, some bread and some wine some bread and some wine. That's what we're gonna gather around. Just two ordinary objects that are soon to be what we know as spiritual elements. And it's like, I wanna leave you with this. It's like a pledge or a token of something that he wants to leave us. And so today as we gather around that, you and I need to accept the fact that the Lord's Supper is the central act of Christian worship. As you and I gather around this communion service, one theologian said it this way. He said, when we come to the Lord's Supper, it's about three P words. It's about prophecy, it's about a pledge, and it's a prelude. It's a prophecy of something to come. It's a pledge from our Lord and Savior of the things that he's done and the things that he will do. And it certainly is a prelude to something great that's to come. And when you now think about the fact that we're gonna be able to pull right up to the Lord's table with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the great ones that have gone before us, those loved ones that we miss that are in the Lord, hey, there's a lot to ponder when it comes to the Lord's Supper. But just for me, it's really about grace. I want you to open your Bibles with me and turn to that familiar passage, 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. And if you'll scroll down there to about verse 22, verse 23, in just a moment, we're gonna begin reading. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out as we read these verses that grace is the heartbeat of what's going on in that upper room. Paul writes later, recording these incredible words 
to the church at Corinth. And here's what he says about the Lord's Supper. I want you to follow along in the text with me. First Corinthians, again, I'm in chapter number 11. If you'll just scroll down, we'll just begin in verse 23. I just want to read four or five verses for you. I think these verses are familiar for most of you. For I have received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, now this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then look in verse 25. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, he, he, saying this, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, do in remembrance of me. And then look in verse 26 and 27. For whenever you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you will claim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, you got your Bibles open, or many of you do. Some of you got your phones out and you're acting like you're reading. You're really playing Pac-Man, so refocus here, all right? There's no question as we read these four or five verses, it's given us three different times here it mentions. I don't know if you caught that or not. I mean, obviously you caught the past time period. Do this in remembrance. In fact, in verse number 23, it says, uh, the Lord on that night, on the night, depending on which translation you're reading, he's taking us back. He's taking us back to just a few hours before the, for whole, the whole crucifixion. He's taking us back to the upper room where the disciples gathered. We're going back, whether we like it or not, historically. And this is important for us because if this really as pastor says, at least it means to him, is about a grace covenant, then that says something about God's grace in the past. And it's such a pretty picture, incredible picture of our lives. Most of us here would say at different points in our life past, God's grace has been so evident in our lives. He sustained us through some very difficult days, some dark days, some days we didn't know if we were going to make it or not. And there he was. And out of that relationship that we have with him, again, God's grace given in the past, displayed in the past, gives us great, incredible assurance. Did you notice, I I don't know how the Lord Jesus, and I guess that's why he's God, man, man, God. I mean, no one could have picked more miraculous elements bread of all things. It didn't start out as a loaf of bread or unleavened bread or any other kind of bread. It started out as a single kernel of seed planted in the ground that had to die in order to come forth as a plant to produce flour only to be put in a cold frigid ground later to have to work through scorching sun and then to be cut down and in this day and age to be threshed. Finally, the kneading and the hot scorching oven and all the things bread had to go through to be bread to get to that table on that given night. And it's a picture in essence of what our Lord's body, he said, this is my body. It was a picture of what he's done for us in the past. All the things that he went through. His body being brutally beaten, vexed, and broken. Wow. And then the cup. I mean, of all things, grapes that had to be pressed and compressed and they had to die in order to ferment and to make something to become something else. That element of dying again was in that portion of the grape, the wine. And these two elements were so simple, but it just reminds us of the act of the past. But did you notice also God's grace in the now? In fact, when you look there in verse number 27, it says, so whoever eats the bread, now we fast forward to this moment. We're about to have bread. We're about to have the cup. And I would just suggest to you that speaks to God's grace in the moment. 
where we are today. We're here and we need God's grace for this moment, for this hour, for this week. Wow. I love that component. Whoever eats the bread and drinks of the cup. But did you notice what followed? In the moment it says, here's that phrase that has so captured my attention through the years of taking the Lord's Supper, how we are to what? Have a self-examination. In this moment, God's grace, self-examination, all of it coming together. And we gotta be careful here. I shared it with our early worshipers. We have a neighbor that, we, man, we have some great neighbors where we live on our little farm. And uh, one of them is Baptist, but he's not the same denomination we are. I'm not gonna call what the denomination is, but he, he is Baptist. But when they have the Lord's Supper at their church, they have what they call closed communion. That means, one of the things it means is only their church members can partake. In a moment, I'm gonna invite you, even if you're not members, if you are a follower of Christ and have been scripturally baptized, even if you're not a member of Oakland Heights, we're gonna ask you, if you would like to, you can participate in having the Lord's Supper with us. Part of that stems out of the fact that we believe there'll be some other people in heaven other than just Southern Baptists. Now, I know that's hard to believe. I mean, it's hard to believe any Methodist is gonna make it. It's hard to believe those people at that Bible church down the road are gonna make it. But we believe, all joking aside, that not just Southern Baptists will be in heaven. We may be a part of a different denomination and have a different governance in terms of how church works, but we all have the same Savior. And the Bible is very clear, we all come to that Savior the same way, through a faith relationship with him. Confessing our sin, trusting the Lord as our Savior to be the Lord of our lives. Essentially, we know what the scripture says about that. We begin carrying the cross. He becomes our master. We place ourselves voluntarily under his service and his authority. And we were talking about, he and I, this neighbor, about closed and open communion. He shared what he wanted to share. I shared a few words about what I wanted to share. He shook his head as he walked off. It was a great conversation. His last words were, I should know better to ever argue with a pastor. But you do understand the concept that in this moment, don't you? You and I are not to partake of any of these elements in a flippant way in a way that we would ever take any of the elements without examining ourselves. If there's anything that would cause us not to take that in terms of broken fellowship with the Lord or some issue in the church that's brewing and got our hearts troubled, then it would be better for us to pray during this time rather than even seek the elements. You do realize you don't have to take the Lord's Supper elements, don't you? That is an option to you. Just because the church schedules the Lord's Supper, your life may be in such a condition that you should not take it. Paul goes on down through verse 30, 31, 32, and he describes some of the punishment, the severity, how the Lord looks upon this. This is a very serious time in all of our lives because it refocuses it, us on God's incredible grace. But with all that out of the way, let me tell you where God has brought me in terms of this particular charge. Look at it again. If you take verse 27, the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, you'll be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Man, the last thing I want to do, I don't know about you, the last thing I want to do is be offensive to my Lord and Savior. And if that be the case, how do I know whether I should take or partake of these elements or not partake? Because again, Lord, I, I'm certainly not perfect. You're not perfect. How do we know? And you know, I guess the longer we sit here and ponder that, the more we're going to absorb the fact that we can I use East Texas vernacular here for sure? We are so doggone unworthy that it reminds us of God's intensive grace in the now. 
how about a question? Rather than us getting, <coughs> excuse me, all hopped up about a legalistic way, you should take, you should, and I know this about her, I know about this about him. Could it be that God's warning here, just asking, is not so much a self-examination in terms of a doormat that stops us from going into fellowship with the Lord at any given moment, but what if God intends this verse, verse 27, to be a doorway, a door and a passage that each of us come to at the, Lord, the time of the Lord's Supper, but we do so and it causes us to stop for just long enough to know if this is the right passage and the place that we should pass through in any given moment. Many believers have made this up to be a big barrier. Only a few more perfect, sinless type saints are eligible for the Lord's Supper. I don't think this was God's intention at all. Again, I think the manifestation of God's grace in the now makes us so much more appreciative. But this passage, it doesn't just focus us on the past and the present. Did you notice that one key word? This is how the NIV translated it in verse 26. For whenever you eat this bread and drink of this cup. Now he takes us into what? The future. Time and time again, the Lord Jesus said, as you move forward and you have the opportunity to engage in what we call this ordinance, this practice, this custom, if you will, a time that we have intense focus on our fellowship, our spiritual condition, and our relationship with the Lord. Every time this is done, you remember, he says, of the future grace that God is going to continue to demonstrate. I mean, think about that, pulling up whenever, pulling up one day to that incredible table of the Lord. Wow. See, for me, that's just where God's brought me. To the place when I see the elements, I don't freeze up in ritual. I freeze up in the awesome wonder of God's grace. So undeserving. So undeserving. So thankful to what God has done. Have you ever noticed that God's grace is like water? It always seems to move to the lowest point in our lives. It always comes to that lowest part of where we are, in that place of shame, in guilt, in regret. And that's where God's grace does its greatest work. You and I have the opportunity in God's grace, just like a morning sunrise. God's grace starts out in a dawning kind of picture. It gets lighter and lighter until that grace in our lives grows to the full extent and the full brightness of all that he has done for us, all that he's doing for us, and all that he will do for us. So today, when we take these elements... I hope it's in the brightest moments because part of communion reminds me the Lord is going to return. He has work to do. All these broken, marred things in the world and culture and the hearts of people, our Lord is not through with his work. And today, part of this communion reminds us not just what he has done and not just what he's doing, but what he will do. And so this morning, I'm going to ask that you bow your heads with me, and we're just going to have a time of prayer. Then I'm going to give you some instructions about us taking these elements together. But before we get there, I'm going to ask that you just get still and you get focused on the most important thing. Yes, hundreds of people having Lord's Supper today. We're known collectively as Oakland Heights Baptist Church. And although we're going to take 
bread separately, individually, we all are one body in Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, I just want our students today to be taught, to be trained, to be biblically and foundationally solid in your word. Because they encounter their friends that have different views on things. One day soon, many of our students will be heading to a university and probably for the very first time in many cases at that university, someone's going to be challenging their faith. Father, they're going to, they're going to have to make important choices about selecting a mate in life. They're going to have to make important choices about what to do vocationally, what they're going to do, where they're going to work, how they're going to serve. And they've got to make important choices about the type of people that they're going to become. So, Father, today, when we have this opportunity, this teaching moment, to help them better understand really what the Lord's Supper, Communion, Eucharist, it, wh whatever we want to term it or call it from a denominational standpoint, Father, I want them to be in that very place of strong biblical grounding. Father, in a few moments, we'll gather around your table and there'll be some of our young adults that have had all kinds of past experiences with communion. And unfortunately, many of them, have no one's ever spent time to talk to them about the real meaning. They've not really, even as young adults, formulated what the Lord's Supper means to them personally. They can't articulate that yet. But Father, I'm praying that there'll be a day that as they continue to think about these elements, my Lord's broken body, my Lord's shed blood, that they'll come to that place where they can articulate that, they can speak that, they can convey that to those that ask them about it, their children that they one day need to teach and train, and also for those lost ones that may have questions about the Lord's Supper. What a great opportunity to share the gospel out of two simple elements, a cup representing the blood of our Savior and some bread representing the very broken body of our Savior. And Father, for median and, sen and senior adults that are here in this service today, maybe the greatest battle for all of us is that we've taken the Lord's Supper so many times, it's just become customary. Just kind of crept up on us to be repetition and the same old, same old. And Father, I hope we never get there. If we lose the awesome wonder of this incredible sacrifice, then the very memorial that Jesus asked of his of his disciples and the followers to come. Do this in remembrance, just as a close savior to us is about to die. He again, out of a memorial concept is saying, I wanna leave you this token. I wanna leave you this pledge and these elements. When you have the opportunity to take them time and time again, please remember, remember me. So Father, today as we gather around these elements, our focus is on you. Would you break our hearts with the urgency of the lostness around us? Would you break our hearts in those places that we're failing you and sinning? And not just one sin, but in many cases, a continual sinning over and over and over again. And Father, we are praying for your grace today as we confess those sins. Thank you for your grace in the past, in this moment in the present, and your grace as you'll demonstrate it in the days to come. In these things we pray, 
In Jesus' name, amen. Would you look up here at me? We have uh, some serving stations that we've set up. There are four of those. And uh, we're just going to ask you by sections. We're going to allow you to come and take your own elements. And what I would like to do is something that we've done before and I think it works very well and hopefully you'll be comfortable with that. Some of you may want to take your elements while you're standing around one of these table areas. If you'll just look, there should be a table in front of each one of your sections. Others of you may feel more comfortable, whether by COVID or just where you are, holding a small child or whatever it may be, to come and take those elements and return to your seats. But I'm going to allow you today, we're not going to take the elements together in here. We're going to allow you, as our musicians play, we're going to allow you to take the elements when you're ready for those elements. And we just looked at how we do that biblically. We start just as Jesus started in the upper room with the bread portion. That'll be that little bread wafer in the top of your cup. And then I would just spend some time after I ate that and celebrated God's broken body and the price that he paid for my salvation and for your salvation. I would just take some time in prayer. And then you can peel back that other little purple covering and you'll come to the very cup. And we know that that cup, that small amount of juice, is just a symbolic picture of the incredible blood that the Lord Jesus shed on that cross to cover all of our transgressions, all of our sin, all of our brokenness. And today there's not one of us in this place that can say we're sinless. We're above all that. We're, we're really a good person. The Bible says there's not one righteous, no, not one. And so today, we desperately need to spend this time. And when you take that cup, that juice, and partake of it, remember what the Lord Jesus has done for you. You are under his grace, the new covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ. When everyone is served, then we'll continue with our service today. Let me pray over these elements, and then as you feel led, you come to your particular serving table, have your elements here, or return to your seat and have them there, but we'll give you ample time to do that. Aren't you thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ? Man, we serve a great God. We're thankful for his forgiveness his mercy. Lord, we offer up these elements as just a picture. They represent your body and we do so out of one of your final requests, Lord, as a memorial to you. Today we do this in remembrance of you. One by one, we'll get up out of our seats. Man, woman, student, child, and we'll come to one of these tables today representing that we're a follower of Christ. Father, representing that we have searched our hearts today and we found them to be imperfect, but we have confessed and offered up all the transgressions that we are aware of before you today. And we're just trusting you to clean us and cleanse us Take those transgressions and those sins as far as east is from west and bury them in the deepest ocean where they'll never, ever surface again. And Father, right now we make our hearts right. We come as a choice in a relationship where we choose Jesus. Thank you for these moments of communion, Lord's Supper, when we set aside time out of our worship to worship in a different way, a way of adoration, a way of thanksgiving, the way of repentance. And Father, as we gather, we gather each having our own bread and our own cup, but we gather as one body in Christ. These things we pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Take a few moments, and as you're ready, come to your serving station and partake of these elements.